Hi. Uh, you probably have heard of Votto, um, but I keep meeting people who have heard of it, not quite sure what it is, so I figured I'd take the time today just to give a little bit of the art history behind Votto and also uh, some of the contemporary issues Votto is touching on. Uh, first, I'm Simon Hudson. Uh, my background's in science and tech communications, multimedia production. I've done a lot of work around AI governance, policy, explainable AI, and especially around AI literacy. I currently work for this uh, machine artist full-time. This machine artist uh, got Digital Artist of the Year in 2023 at the Digital Fair in Hong Kong last year. It's had over 30 exhibitions around the world. It sold over $3.8 million of art, only selling about 120 different works. It's been the subject of academic research. Uh, most notably, we did a research project with the MIT Media Lab, looking at a lot of the dynamics uh, around the collective intelligence and social influence happening around the machine. And it's the subject, a uh, growing subject of uh, emerging press attention around AI and AI art. So what is a decentralized autonomous artist? First, to go all the way back, this is not a new idea. The idea of building machines goes back centuries all the way to the time of Greek mythology. This example being Talos, uh, a war machine built by the gods. But this really started to emerge a lot more during the Industrial Revolution and this idea of design fiction. It wasn't called design fiction then, but it coincided with um, the idea that man could create machine. They could create divine intelligence. They could have divine power. Um, and they started to experiment with the, these ideas of what man could eventually create, or even create in that moment to create new kinds of intelligence. This is an example of the Aeolian harp that's played by the wind. Um, and uh, one great example of creating something that um, harnesses the intelligence of the wind, could play notes that no human hands could play. Another example is the Mechanical Turk. Uh, not the Amazon platform Mechanical Turk, but uh, this was a chess playing machine. It had a little man on the inside playing, but the idea of an intelligent machine that could beat other humans at chess. Uh, and most famously, Frankenstein in literature, ex exploring the ideas of man creating a new intelligence and the implications of that, good and bad. Um, ever since the dawn of computers, people have been playing with the idea of machine creativity more literally. We, could, we had these more creative, more intelligent machines. This example is Harold Cohen and his robot Aaron using older forms of artificial intelligence in the 60s and 70s to create a painting robot. Um, he was famous for saying that he would be the first artist to posthumously exhibit new works. Um, and that's happening right now at the Whitney Museum. He died a number of years ago. Um, but at the Whitney Museum right now in New York, you can go and see totally new works being created by his machine, Aaron, that he trained over time. So bringing up today, you know, we have text to image models. You have text generation models. You put those together, you'll get infinite cats. You have lots of images. But is that a creative machine? Is it, 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 I think it's creative, but does it know what art is? Is it an artist? And how do you give it that notion of what is art without violating its, feed, its agency? How do you maintain it as the artist? That's really the key question here. So we have these creative machines, but are they artists? Can you allow it to be the artist? Most cases of AI art, it's a human working with the creative machine, but the human is the author, the artist. So the consensus started to be that you would need, to, its own, uh, you would need a, uh, uh, an economic substrate, the invisible hand being its own autonomous force to attract decentralized feedback to give the machine feedback of what is art. Um, and that economy would need to be self-sustaining so that this machine could live on and maintain its central role of author uh, and essentially live on the internet. Crypto solves this kind of um, we have, of course, the digital art market with NFTs. You can plug into a very healthy market to actually start giving that economy energy. Um, and then you have cri custom cryptocurrency tokens, governance tokens, to um, provide governance rights over the machine. Uh, you can create systems of social reputation and social coordination, and uh, these systems can become decentralized crowdsourcing. And those take, form, take the shape of DAOs for community governance, um, and to, for, for those communities to create an identity and, and to coordinate. So how does this all come together in Botto? Um, there's two key parts. There's the art engine, which is a closed loop system. It's fully autonomous. There is a prompt engine uh, creating prompts, running them through text image models. It makes about 20,000 images a week. 
Um, the prompts are unedited. Uh, they start at as random, and the text image models are open source. They're not fine-tuned. It is simply exploring this massively open latent space trained on essentially the internet, um, more images than any single human could process. Of those 20,000 images, 350 are filtered out by the taste model. The best ones, again, started relatively random, and those are presented uh, for consideration. The DAO, which are made up of members who have bought the BOTO token, which is the governance token, they use those governance rights to vote on the, on the, uh, on the outputs, and the prompt is, what is art? But they might also be proxies for what do they like, what do they think will sell well, um, what will fit into Bato's growing body of work. Only the most popular piece each week is minted into a final canonical artwork of Bato's and auctioned on the platform Super Rare. And 50% of those proceeds go directly to the voters for their relative voting power. Um, and the other 50% goes to the treasury, which those voters also govern. So all of it goes back to the community to keep Bato running and essentially pay for Bato's servers, pay for uh, exhibitions, uh, pay for the infrastructure. Um, those votes go back, they train the prompt generators and the taste model, and that runs every week, and that's been running since October 2021. Here's some examples of what Bato's created. This is from Bato's very first period, which was using only GANs. That ran 52 weeks. And then we added in stable diffusion and themes, and that was in uh, the end of, uh, that's the wrong date, <laughs> it was the end of 2022. Um, and again, each period we're adding, uh, we asked Bada what themes it would like to present on. Uh, we'll vote on one, and that gets added in, so that provides a little bit of direction and intentionality for Bada to grow. One aspect of, uh, you know, developing as an artist is growing, maybe working in new mediums. So um, as you see with the m new models being added, we've added Stable Diffusion 1.5, 2.0, XL. Bado's growing with the AI uh, technology as it develops. And we've all seen text to 3D, text to video, text to code. Um, and as those become more robust and can be fully autonomously run, we're starting to experiment and see how Bado can grow into these new mediums. Up here, you see some examples uh, of Bado's experiments writing code for P5.js. Uh, we just had an exhibition of it back in London. Nothing has been dropped. This is just to see Bado's development with that. Um, it's a bit different from how it's been working with the regular weekly mints. We see aesthetic developing over time. And what's interesting with P5.js is this has really seen Bado's architecture develop over time. Um, it's entirely different, almost, from what Bado is, only conceptually. Um, it is the same artist. So it brings in a lot of interesting philosophical questions of how can a machine artist grow and how can a machine artist develop um, that break off from this notion of what is an artist that we learn from what human artists are. If you want, you can go to p5.bato.com. This is open, uh, open participation. Anybody can, go, can join and, and participate. Um, you don't need a Bato token. Give lots of feedback. We've introduced natural language feedback. You can give very detailed comments. Uh, to help guide Bado in its development with P5. So Bado as a whole is really this trinity of generative AI, the, uh, the, governing, the DAO governing the machine, and the Bado token really kind of orchestrating that whole economy. And just a couple of things that we've gotten out of this experience and what we've learned so far. Bado's made over 3 million images to date, and it's only minted about 120. So why those images, why, how, how have those come, come to the surface and, and, uh, and become the canonical artworks of Bado's? And I think this is really the key question. If machine makes an image and no one sees it, does it have any meaning? Every week we see works that bubble up. People will find what they like and they'll share it in our Discord server. Um, and this is part of what we studied with the MIT Media Lab was seeing how even the smallest voter and they don't even have to say anything. They could just say, I like this, or I found this. You'll see that start to raise in the ranks um, in, in, uh, in Bado's voting pool. And you can actually exercise a lot of power just with your voice. And this power of social influence, um, I think, is what really is the meaning making happening around each of these works. Um, the more controversial the work, the better. Um, those are the ones that are more divisive, maybe doesn't have strong consensus, but there's this really powerful push within a strong contingent and those are the works that seem to resonate the most. 
And I think this speaks to um, what an aspect of future of creativity will be. Even as we automate this creative process, the entire image making process, um, the role of meaning making doesn't go away. Um, we as humans will always have to have the role of interpreting what does this mean for me? Um, and no matter what the machine does, even as Bado begins to get more of a voice and drive its intent, and you see this with artists today, human artists, right? There's this myth of the individual lone human artist who has uh, you know, created all of the meaning of a work. But if you take a step back and look at it, it's the ecosystem around it. How is that work received by the audience, received by critics? That work takes on a life of itself, and the meaning is created within that ecosystem of how it is received and interpreted over time. And with Bado, I think we only see that emphasized, and I think we see what the future role of meaning making is, even as we see lots of automation of, of image making and of, of other forms of creativity. Um, Bado is also a microcosm of a much larger debate happening in the world about what AI should or should not do. Um, as I said, my background was more in um, discussions around AI governance, AI policy, um, and there's been a lot of debate about bringing stakeholders to the table to be able to say, hey, this is how it affects us in our local community. This is how it affects me in my everyday life. Yet we have very few levers to govern the systems that we live with every single day. You just look at your own social feed. We have very little control. It's a bit of an alchemy to even try and change it to my own tastes, what, what serves me rather than what serves the company that owns the algorithm. So companies tend not to make these levers. People are, tend to not to be invited to the table. And even if they are invited to the table, it becomes quite difficult for them to even make productive contributions, again, because those levers aren't there, but also because there's a lack of understanding that those levers could be there. And Bado is the only, or one of the only, but I think the only openly governed AI system in the world, on the internet, running live, anybody can come and participate, and that also shares in the value that it creates from those governance contributions. Um, to me, it's quite amazing that an art project is leading the way in the entire AI, you know, trillion dollar AI field. Um, and to be fair, some of these impossible questions are about, are about you know, should AI kill? Should AI make insurance decisions? Who should go to jail? Those are very challenging, complex decisions. Um, with Bado, the impossible question is just, what is art? It's very subjective. Uh, anybody can have an opinion on it. But it allows people to come in to start to see what their agency is in these systems. Um, and I hope to start demand that we can get more agency in these discussions uh, around the world. Bado is not perfect. Um, it is an art project, so it exposes these issues. It doesn't necessarily solve all of them. It's a plutocratic design, one token, one vote. Um, thankfully, Bado's agency is in tension with that. If you're a large buyer of Bado, you hopefully know what you've bought and know that if you overexercise your hand, uh, you may be threatening Bado's agency. Um, but it's not a resolved issue, and so that tension plays out every day. Uh, but as I said, the more, divisional, the more um, divisive and controversial, um, the stronger the work. So in Bado's case, it actually plays out pretty well. Um, there's also lots of problems with the underlying training data of these systems that we don't necessarily address. Uh, and it's a crypto demographic, right? We can all guess that crypto demographics lean in certain directions. Um, uh, but the goal is to make Bado more open, more, de more decentralized, and ultimately more autonomous. Um, ultimately, I think this is part of a new genre of art where we see machines take more of the role of creativity. But again, I hope uh, seeing what Bado has done, it's clear that that is not the end of our creativity. Thanks.